Hi, everyone. This is turning my phone into a skimming device, Enpost Solutions. We'd like to introduce ourselves briefly. I'm Ileana Barrenuevo. I'm a security engineer and security researcher at UTN. I am from Cordoba, Argentina. And this is Sam Borgoño. Hi, uh, I'm a security engineer at uh, Datos Seguros, also a security, security researcher. There are our Twitter tags if you want to, to follow us. Uh, I work at Datos Seguros. We are trying to protect data and people through a new type of risk, uh, risk management, democratizing uh, cyber insurance, saving companies from bankruptcy after a cyber attacks through advanced uh, risk analysis. Uh, this is the agenda. Well, we'll talk about why we chose these devices, these solutions, <laughs> which are the security concerns that we found, and how we hack them by taking different paths, such as network traffic analysis, application analysis, Bluetooth, hardware, and so on. Go ahead. So. What are uh, digital wallets and w what's the impulse and how everything is connected? Well, digital wallets are a way to, for you to have your money stored in, in, your, in your phone. Basically, you can receive money, you can transfer money, or you can do operations with your money. Uh, the problem comes when you have a business, you want to receive payments from anyone. For example, you're sending things, and you are trying to, to get payments from a guy that doesn't have the same wallet, or may have a Craig debit card. So these devices, basically what they do is they allow you to interact with the credit card information and to receive the data that you need to make a payment. And they're connected through Bluetooth. These solutions are widely available in Argentina, so that's why we try to, to analyze them. And as you can see, they are pretty common. There are a lot of, of devices that are out there. Uh, we have very different uh, digital wallets, and all these devices have uh, different providers. So you can see in the bottom that there is a lot of providers, Bboss, Magic Boss, Stripe, Dispreet, and, and among others. So um, you need to keep in mind that you have the, 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 the manufacturer and the digital wallet implementator. And the one thing that you need to keep in mind as well is that the attacker right now might be the digital wallet owner. So you have this, you have this business and you're trying to receive payments. When you are receiving a payment, you need to protect the client data from the guy that is paying and using his credit card to, to give you money. So right now, the attack surface, uh, it's a little bit bigger. And the way we choose these devices to, to assess them is that in the first case is that they are sending very critical information over Bluetooth, which is credit card information. So uh, we might, you, you might know that Bluetooth uh, 4.0 is very vulnerable. You can do a shy hack attacks, and you can do a lot of stuff with Bluetooth. So our first question was, uh, how secure is this? It's really secure. You can really see the critical information from the air, or not? Is it that difficult? On the other hand, uh, we saw that um, differently from the, the components or the, the impulse that have a, a specific system embedded in, in it, when you're trying to use your mobile application with those devices, you can control the, the data flow. You can control the payment process. And this is very, it's a big problem because right now you can try, amongst other things, to make a reply attack. You can try a different payment. You can show the client uh, one amount of money and then charge it for a bigger amount or something like that. So we try to figure out how vulnerable is that the the, the critical owner, the, the digital owner, owner can manipulate the, the payment flow. And the th third thing is that we have a really wide attack surface. You can hack data entry, you can hack the hardware, you can hack the firmware, you can hack the Bluetooth, you can do shy hack over Bluetooth, you can have manipulation of the application, you can reverse an SDK that uh, a, a third party is providing to you to integrate with your digital wallet. You can manipulate network traffic. There is a lot of things, and you need to implement security measures on each one of those steps. So the attack surface is really big. So as you can see, this is a simple graphic. Uh, all those are attack points, right? So you can try to get the critical information, for example, in each one of those points. So the other thing that you need to understand is what are the features that these, those devices provide? Um, these devices uh, allow you to read EMB, which is the, the chip from the credit card. You can read the max stripe information, which is the black stripe in the back of your credit card. For the, your credit card. You can read NFC and receive NFC, NFC payments. And those devices allow a firmware update over the air. They receive over the air uh, key updates 
because I'll explain later how the case system management works. And they have Bluetooth, uh, low energy, and EDR, which is the 3.0. And they support pretty much every uh, payment standard. And you need to keep in mind that to understand uh, what we've done uh, is that these devices encrypt credit information to be sent to the backend. And the way this is done is by a key management system um, a protocol, which is called DUKPT. Basically, what this device uh, have is a specific key. You have as a um, uh, wallet provider, you have a master key. And for each one of the devices that are going to the market, you will uh, generate a specific key, which is called the EPEC. And this key will be embedded in the, in the firmware. And then in, for each transaction that we'll try to do, you'll try to generate a new key, a session key, to encrypt this information. And when this information gets to the back end, cipher with a triple DES, the back end system will try to generate the same key based on the device itself and the transaction that is occurring. So there is no interchange of a key, but this is a cipher, uh, cipher channel between the device and the back end. So after that, the, best, the transaction when uh, it's, it's, it's get done. And the other thing that you didn't understand is that credit information provides a lot of stuff. Amongst them, you can read uh, Max Stripe. You can, uh, the Max Stripe is uh, a stand, uh, it's, it's a fixed data. You can clone it. It's not something that you can change. Um, you have AMB data, NFC data, which is a specific protocol that allows you to make payments. But they have a, a, another additional cipher link over it. I uh, won't get into details, but you need to know that there's a different protocols and stuff that you can get from a credit card. So moving on to the network traffic. Well, we're starting analyzing one of the cases, one of the application vendors that interacts with this device. And well, <laughs> we intercepted the traffic. We actually realized that we can read and modify any data traveling on the requests and the responses. We use Frida, Objection, Meet and Proxy, Burp Suite, and well, any proxy. <laughs> and we can control the whole payment flow. And we capture, we can capture the encrypted information that comes from this device, and we can try <laughs> different use cases, such as reusing data, reconstructing information. Well, we had to break the SSL pinning, so we use Frida scripts and running with objection and a proxy. And here we have the first use case, which is data reconstruction. We have seen that this particular application was managing information. We have obtained information from the backend that wasn't used at the front end. So we have seen that. That is the encrypted information, the credit card number, and the CVV, and expiration, etc. But the backend returns the same information and non encrypted. So there you see the first A numbers of the credit card number and the DNI and the last four numbers and expiration data. So, well, <laughs> that data wasn't being used at front end. So we should try to reconstruct the complete credit card number. So how many attempts should I do? Nearly 9,000, right? But to get these four numbers that we are missing, <laughs> we should do only 999 attempts because the credit card number follows a specific structure that can be validated with that script, for example, right? So we should do brute force, and then <laughs> we get these four missing numbers. And then we have the whole picture to make payments, <laughs> malicious payments. So. So even though the credit card data was traveling ciphered, when the, the, the response for each one of the payments came through, you can get this data to reconstruct uh, any credit card information. Um, well, this is the next use case, which consists of reusing data. TUKPT states that the key, the transaction key, should be used once and then should be discarded. So what if we resend a request that has the encrypted information with this key traveling in the request. What if we resend the request after a valid payment? It should fail, following the standard. But here we have the, the process. 
we initiate the transaction, the customer makes a payment on the device, we capture by analyzing the traffic, we capture the request, the transaction goes well, is accepted, but then when the customer leaves the store, we started, we triggered another payment with our cards, but then we replace the request with the credit card information that is encrypted, but we have saved it previously. And so, then we make another payment. <laughs> so you should keep in mind that there is a gray area between the responsibilities of the uh, device provider and the, uh, and the digital wallet owner. So these things comes to get in the gray area that no one wants to take the responsibility about, about the things that you should do, and you should not do, do with the, the great data. And here we are positioned as merchants. We are the attacker merchants. So here's the demo of the reply attack. So we have two phones with two different applications. And we're trying to make a payment from on the first digital wallet, capture the data, and then we open a second uh, digital wallet with a second device, and we'll try to dummy a uh, credit card payment, and then we'll replace this credit card da dum dummy data with the previous one, and we'll, you will see that we have a successful transaction. So right now, uh, everything's connected to Midtown Proxy. Uh, I already done a transaction. So the, the payment went through. So, sorry, this is the first payment. Uh, Ring connected. I'm getting the, the traffic from medium proxy. I just received the, the encrypted credit card information from the first payment. Again, don't bother about uh, getting this data. Uh, it's all fixed, so you won't be able to use this data. But once the right here, I'm, I'm uh, using a simple identification number that you need in Argentina to make a payment. And you will see that the transaction is approved. So the client left the store, goes to her home, pretty happy. He paid 55 pesos. And I'll turn off the Wi-Fi, and leave everything on the side. And I use a different um, account in another phone. I'm getting the information, the Greek information that shouldn't be used to, to resend uh, for another payment. And saving this data, just in a text file. Uh, that's cipher data. You can see the key SN, which is a transaction key which allows you to generate on the back end the new key to surface data. And right now I'm turning the phone, uh, Wi-Fi, to make another payment. That's a dummy card. This uh, it's already expired. And I use it to make an uh, initial payment. So right now I'm intercepting the traffic. And I will be replacing this data. So turn on the device, make another payment for a bigger amount. That's about a dollar. And right now you'll see that I'll trigger the, the device, but I will capture the, the information on the traffic, on network traffic. I will replace the, the information with the previous one. And I resume the, the traffic, and you'll see that right now I need to, uh, again, input our data. This is not validated, so I just can input whatever you want. And you'll see that the transaction went through. So. There, there are worse things. Where, where are you? Be? So you can see that right here, I, we have uh, the, sorry, I was trying to show you. Oh, man. It was the second transaction and the wallet from the customer with a the, with the valid payment. Yeah, you can see right here, we have the two payments from the same client, and the second payment was never, never actually executed, it was, and it was charged. So. Going back to the presentation. OK, well, let's move on to application analysis. We have seen network traffic, and now 
we are going to hook the methods from the SDK, SDK, <laughs> SDK sorry. And we have the SDK and the device interacting with the application. So we try to manipulate the objects, the instances related to the encrypted card information coming from this. So we are abusing TUKPT implemented here. And remember that we have this case in which we cannot reuse the key because this was fixed, we, this was reported and fixed. We shouldn't use, again, the same request. But encrypted card information shouldn't be used again, too. So we are the ones interacting with the SDK and the device, so we can manipulate and get as many keys and as many encrypted card information as we want. This was theoretical. Um, we thought about it last year. We tested this year, and it worked. So <laughs> how it works? <laughs> we initiate a transaction. The customer is going to pay taps the car on this device, we capture that car encrypted car information, right? And we try to make the payment fail. So in the second attempt from the customer, we are sending to you in, in the previous car information. And in this second tap, this second attempt from the client, we are capturing also that information and we are saving it on memory. And then when the customer leaves, we are, <laughs> we are going to pay again with this second tap that we capture. And the transaction will be accepted. This is a little script that we developed to run with objection. We hooked the method, the serializer that triggers the request that completes the operation, the payment. And we enumerate all the instances related to the objects, um, the credit car information that comes from here. And well, we can save on an array or send to a server. And in the first attempt, we are sending geometry in order to make the payment fail. And well, that method returns this unit at first instance, and then we are sending the previous car information that we are saving in each tab. And well, we are sending the information to a server if we want. And uh, well, in order to understand this process, we have two requests. The first one that initiates the payment, and the second one that completes that operation with an operation ID that is got from the first request. Now in the demo, we are showing you the requests and responses, but uh, I wanted to make it clear that we are not manipulating the traffic. We are only manipulating the instances at runtime. We are manipulating and hooking the methods of the SDK. So let's start with the demo. <laughs> well, we are start starting the application. The customer is going to pay. We are pairing the device. This is the first step. We are capturing the information, but we are sending GUMI data in order to make the payment fail. Well, we are completing the DNI for legal reasons. And then we are triggering the, the first request, starting the payment with valid data, but the second one is GUMI data because we want to make the payment fail. Right? So then <laughs> there's an error, and we say to the customer, hey, let's try it again. We have captured this valid information from the credit card. And in this second term, we are capturing also the credit card information, but we are sending the previous one from the first tab that we have captured. So completing again, legal data. And then we are sending, well, starting the payment again, because this is a valid transaction. We get an operation ID, which is needed to complete the transaction later with this second request. And then we are sending the previous card information that we have saved. And this wasn't used. Well, <laughs> we have triggered 
Now, the malicious payment, the customer leaves the store, <laughs> really, really happy. <laughs> then we trigger another payment as an attacker, as a merchant attacker. We start the operation. We get the operation ID from the first request. And then we are sending this previous card information from the customer, which is encrypted. I don't need to know where, what, is the, what the credit card number is or the CVV. So we completed a payment. So here we have a valid transaction, and the customer will see <laughs> a second payment. But just to clarify, we tried to manipulate the price, but this was validated at back end. So and the, the price was the first one that the customer paid previously. So that was the demo. And the second one. <laughs> oh. And well, just to, in order that you understand how the script is, uh, This is a script running with objection. We are capturing the first tap, but we tamper the method, the serializer, and we send the GUMI data. Yeah. We are saving car information. We are linking it to a server. <laughs> and this is the second tap when the customer tries again, but we are sending the previous one, right? The first one. Well, this is the attacker tab, and we are sending the second tab from the customer. <laughs> it's a little, a little strange, but we are sending previous data, and the payment goes well. So let's move on to Bluetooth. So Bluetooth analysis, um, we don't open the, all the devices. There are mainly four. And all of them share the, pretty much the same uh, Bluetooth chip, which is the iChip YC1021. This, if you go to the data sheet, you'll see that this device supports Bluetooth 3.0 and 5.0. And you might know that Bluetooth low energy is quite vulnerable. You can do shy hack attacks. You can do a lot of stuff. Uh, so we, op we downloaded um, a test application that some of these providers uh, allow you to use to interact with the device and to see if the device is working properly or not. Uh, so we hacked this application to make it work with Bluetooth uh, low energy. And we used Bluejack, which is a tool that we love a lot, using three micro bits connected to a USB hub. We were able to sniff all the, the advertisement packets. And we, tried to, we, we were able to sniff uh, critical information from a payment. And you can see in the left, there is the, the application itself, the testing application. It will show you the same, the same information, cipher information that we sent to the back end. And it will be deciphered at the end. And you can see in the right, the Wireshark analysis. And you can see the same information is being shown on both sides. So we are, we, we are, effect, uh, uh, we are sniffing the same information that is being sent to uh, the backend. So the, the Bluetooth is not adding any, uh, adding any ciphering over the traffic. But we would try to, to do the same attack against all the digital wallets. We weren't able to, it, to do it, because, mostly because all of them use a Bluetooth EDR, which is the 3.0. And it's based on the pairing mechanism. So uh, to see what it, the, the data that is sending over Bluetooth EDR, we were able to get the HCI debug log from Android. And doing, we ran a lot of analysis over this traffic. And we found out that the same data is traveling over the, the HCI. But since a Bluetooth ear is adding another uh, layer of, of ciphering, you cannot get this information from just sniffing Bluetooth uh, 3.0. And if you will, were able to do it, you'll need a really expensive tool, which we don't have. But doing just a little bit of research over these devices, uh, you'll see that the first time you try to pair this device to your phone, you will be uh, shown with a numeric comparison. Numeric comparison is basically a pairing method where you show the same six-digit number 
on the device and on the, um, on the phone, and you need to click accept on those devices. I don't know if you see what's the problem. You, have, you don't have any screen in those devices. You have no way to see or to know what are you paying to. So we try to do a money on me attack. Uh, basically, what we created is just a, a very simple script where you, where you use a single Bluetooth adapter and basically doing a Bluetooth analysis over the traffic, we found out that all the traffic information was sent over Bluetooth with an SPP protocol, which is basically serial over Bluetooth. It's just transmit and send data. That's it. You need just one channel. So we emulated the channel, and we created a simple script, which is trying to listen uh, based on a regex to, to see if there is a, a device that is turned on. Other thing that you need to keep, keep in mind is that for each transaction, you need to turn on the device because it turns uh, off itself after three, maybe five minutes. So for each transaction, you need to turn it on, and it accepts connection from pretty much anyone because, again, you don't have any way to pay it correctly with any other with any device. So uh, our script, what it does is trying to it start listening in the air. It just connects as fast as it can to the device, and then it starts simulating the same device and provides the same SPP protocol. So. That's the setup. It's very simple. You have on one side the device turned on, a Raspberry Pi with Python, and then the, the mobile application will try to connect automatically to the device that we are emulating. So, this is demo. Um, this is one digital wallet. You can see right here that that's the, the remote desktop for the, the Raspberry Pi. We, try, we start the, the money in Mio attack. You can see that it's already uh, saw the device. It's connected to itself, and right now it's emulating the same device. So I, I just uh, enter to the mobile application, the digital wallet. I go to try to make a payment. And right now, those devices are paid. But you'll see that everything works pretty good. Right now, you can see all the, great, the traffic information between the application, the Raspberry Pi, and the, the Empos device. But right now, I'll try to make a payment, and you can see all the, the information right from the air on the Miami attack. So, the payment mechanism doesn't allow you to know what are you actually paying to. The device doesn't know who, where it's paying to, and the mobile application doesn't know. So what do we, can we do with this? Um, with the money in the middle attack, we can do basically a quick uh, max stripe. We can try to do a max stripe stealing. Uh, since the device accepts connection from, from anyone, you can try to do an over the air update or, or EPEC update, which is the key that is itself. Or you can try to do a DUKPT bypass, which is pretty much the same as Ileana shown, but on Bluetooth level. You try to force a, a bad payment, you try it again, you saw, save the data from the two, the, the two manipulations, and you send just one, and the other it's already valid to make a second payment. But I wanted to show you. Uh, a little big, uh, a little thing of um, this is the second try that we've done with money in the middle attack. This is another digital wallet, and we charge just a, a, a small payment. And I know you you might be able to see something quite interesting. Um, again. The, the car owner and the, the guys that's running the store doesn't know that this is a guy in the middle. So right here you can see that everything is working properly. I used an NFC payment, and everything is working correctly. Uh, but I tried something different. I tried the max type. And again, this, this data from the max type, this card is already expired on the water. But this information should be ciphered. There's no way this information is traveling in plain text, right? So for another payment, and you can see right there, this is the plain text uh, max stripe information from the air. So basically, you can go to any site.
You can go to any store in Argentina that, that you're using this uh, solution, sit there, and start receiving credit card information. You can go with this data and emulate a card with MaxPoof. That's pretty much it. So uh, moving forward, um, hardware analysis. Uh, we are not hardware hackers, disclaimer. We're trying to be, uh, but these are the four devices that are r right now available in Argentina. We took them apart, and we saw that they share the same principles amongst all of them. You have the smaller ones, which don't su doesn't support NFC, and the bigger one that supports NFC, basically. So uh, what are the valuable points? I mean, what can I get as a, a low-level uh, hardware hacker from this? Well, the first thing that I think is really interesting to have is the critical information that is traveling uh, on the devices. Uh, DMC or EMB tokens are also very data to make a payment. So if I get to take all this information, I could go make payments. Uh, the firmware might be really interesting to find bugs and hack other devices. Uh, the AP key, which allo will allow me to uh, decipher my own data and they may make uh, another payment. Or maybe the UART logs will allow me to, to see a few logs that might be uh, leaking uh, important information. But you can see right here, this is uh, really basic. Uh, this is the connectors and things that you might find in, in these devices. You have a Bluetooth connector, an MB connector with connected chip, a controller, a max stripe, which is pretty much a tape head connected to an amplifier. And in the back, well, you can see the amplifier and the MB front end, and of course the Bluetooth, uh, I don't know if you have said it already. Uh, but in the bigger devices, you might find, again, Bluetooth, a microcontroller, uh, we found out that this is a flash memory. Uh, we suspect this, uh, this is where the firmware is stored. Uh, we have as well a tape head, a battery controller, and an EFC front end, of course, to interact with NFC. So this is something, this is a very basic diagram on what are the, the main components that all these devices we have. So we went to, for the long hanging fruit, and after running a, a few analysis, stuff like that, we found out that the device was still working, all open. So do you have any anti-tampering measures? And that's a must. When you have a, a credit card or, or credit card reader or whatever payment system, you need to have anti-tampering measures to avoid anyone to just hook in the data bus and start stealing information. Why? Because you have clear text traffic between each one of the your, your components. You have the controller which provide, which provides you with a little bit of uh, cryptography, but in the meanwhile, mean, between the data is traveling from the, the peripheral and the controller, you have clear text traffic. So we went for the long hanging fruit, and we tried to, to get the max information from a simple swipe, which is pretty much like a common schema. That's pretty much what it is. So um, that's, the, um, that's the amplifier. It's connected to the tape head. And we connected an oscilloscope to the tape head. And you can see in the, in the left that you have a waveform which is the encoding for the credit card information from the, from the max stripe. And you can see that the, the, the shape is very specific. So this is what we saw on the oscilloscope, pretty much the same shape. This data is on clear tra text traffic. So we got the data. We tried to create a skimmer. A skimmer will try to get this data and transmit it over the air, whatever you can. Disclaimer, this is overkill, of course. Don't, don't get angry. Uh, there is another way to do this. I'll, I'll show you. But <laughs> we used uh, Blue Peel, which is an Arduino with a specific chipset that allowed me to have really high rates of analog reads over the, the, the data that is being sent between the tape head and the controller. And we were sending all this data on raw data over the Bluetooth, which is, again, overkill. And we were receiving this data with um, a Raspberry Pi connected to a bomber cat, which is a device that, amongst other things, allow you to emulate credit card information. So we create a little script for both these things. Uh, Raspberry Pi will decode the data, will create, will create the, the specific uh, max the data that need to be sent to the bomber cat over serial, and the bomber cat will emulate this data. So uh, here's the demo. So here's the test application. Here's the open device. It's working right now as, as it is. Here's the, um, the hardware input implant, and that's the receiver. And that's another uh, card, uh, credit card receiver, basically to see that the same information that we have sent are the same one that we are emulating. 
So right now I'll try to make a swipe. And you'll see that all this information right now has been sent over Bluetooth. This is all the, the data points. And right now you can see that right at the bottom, that's the track two of the decoded data. And this data is being sent to the bomber cat that is in the bottom, you cannot see it right now. And right now I'm emulating the data and you can see that pretty much it's the, the same. Uh, not pretty much, it's the same data, the track two that we were able to send over the air. Again, this is overkill, uh, this way easier way to do this, but this is what uh, worked for us. And this, uh, just to show you, uh, that the device is still working by itself. Right now you can see that the, the hardware input, again, because we are not hardware hackers, is creating a lot of noises. Um, so when I try to make a payment, uh, of course it, it, it will fail, but if I disconnect the, the hardware input, you'll see that. Everything will work. Um, I just deconnected the, the device, and you can see that you're receiving the same encrypted data. What this device is supposed to do when it's open, it should wipe out all the keys, and you shouldn't be able to cipher any data. So this is a big deal, because uh, you don't know if you're paying, uh, even though the, the network traffic or the Bluetooth traffic might not be tampered, you don't know if the, there is anything embedded in the device. Uh, so this is what the scheme and implant looks like. It's quite big, uh, it's huge. Uh, the receiver you can see on the left and you can see the transmitter on the right. It's pretty big. But we find out that there's another way to do it. We use a really simple 433 uh, RF transmitter connected directly to the, 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 the energy input of the, the same device. And we were able to uh, make a, a few swipes and transmit the same data over a, to, to a receiver, and you can see that it's quite small. The thing that we weren't able to decode this data correctly because there's a lot of noises and these devices are not that, uh, uh, not that good at just meaning really, uh, really f uh, nice information over there. So the last thing that, uh, the last analysis, uh, working on one of those uh, digital wallet companies, we saw that, you should, you, should, you should keep in mind that there's a trust chain between the device and the backend, because since the same keys being generated on both ends, uh, all the data is trusted between each one of the points. So, um, in most of digital wallets, you have these uh, fraud prevention systems where you are trying to make a same payment over and over, and if it fails three, maybe four times, your credit card might be blocked. So we were saying that the, we we are heard uh, we heard about a lot of clients complain about payments that they, they never had done. And we were seeing that there was a lot of tryout payments for a bigger amount of money um, and all failed. And pretty much every payment was the same. The data from the payment, the credit card was the same, but they were changing the CVV number, which is a secure number embedded inside the, the master information. So we tried to replicate this problem to see what the fuck is, what is going on. And we found out that uh, we, we created a max proof. We didn't have the, the bomber cut uh, back then. And we tried to, same, to do the same execution, just trying to change the CV number. And we find out that the application behaved really differently, even though the credit card was blocked. The, the, the application behaved differently if the CV was correct uh, or if it's, it is not. So if the CV was not correct, uh, the application showed you something, and if it was correct, it showed you a different thing. So uh, the attacker, once he gets to the right CVV number, he waited for the client to unlock his card, and then he will go up there and make another payment. So this is a problem mostly related to uh, the trust chain between the devices and the gray area between the responsibilities of the, the, the device provider and the, and the digital wallet um, the vendor. So conclusion. Well, final thoughts? Companies should use encrypted end-to-end -end solutions that implement anti-tampering with anti-tampering measures, and it's important to read the manual to know how to implement also the, the, the TUKPT standards in, its, in, its, in this case. And reuse data should be denied for known reasons. <laughs> And it could be good if an expiration or a TTL could be added to, to this encrypted card information in order that no one can reuse it later.
<coughs> so you, you have seen that we can save the information and using another opportunity. And another way to associate um, with a signature or, uh, I don't know, something that associates the accounts with the device and a device ID or the impulse information and additional things that you can add. Okay, um, one thing, uh, we, we think that one of the most critical things uh, is that you can manipulate data. So, as Ileana said, we, thought, we think that you should uh, digital sign everything that you're saying to the back end to make sure that the client is not manipulating the data. That's really difficult to do. Sometimes you might find in Android that you can do pretty much whatever you want with your application. Um, on the other hand, uh, you should have any out of bounds painting method because, again, these devices. If they, they intend to be chipped and you don't want to add the screen, you need to provide another way uh, to avoid mining the media attacks. So all the point pairing might work with those devices because you can pair them uh, with NFC, for example. So that might work. And there is no, no way for me as an attacker to make a, a mining the media attack as, uh, as itself. Um, or you can add a, device, uh, a screen to the devices to just to, to be sure that you're paying to the right device. We think that this problem is quite uh, quite dumb. I mean, it's really easy to, to fix it, but uh, it might be related to the, the implementation and, and the design of the solution by itself. So these are the repositories. Uh, the man in the middle is called Pritiado. Um, the post, the, the hardware implant, again, uh, we are not hardware hackers, so sorry if you see things that you might not like. And the card, inj card injection is the repository for the Frida and objection scripts. And we would like to thank a few friends of ours, Adrian Perroneo, Marino Marino, Color Hacker Space, and Joaquin Marela for help us and give us our recommendations and tips to how to do sort of things. So thank you. We're open to questions. <laughs>